Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast. My name is Luke Burridge and this is the show where I review every single science fiction book that I read as I read it. There's no set schedule, it's just whenever I finish a book I do the review, stick it up here on the podcast feed for everyone to download and listen to. And today I'm going to be talking about the third book in a series... Um, and this series is the Terra, Ign- Terra Ignota series by Arda Palmer. Last year, um, uh, when I was actually put it this way, when I was looking back at last year and trying to decide what my favourite book was that I read last year, or the favourite story that I read last year, this was well up there because it's a new book or a new series of books uh, by Arda Palmer, the Terra Ignota series. And I gave uh, Two Light the Lightning 4.5 stars. I was really blown away with it. I loved so much about it. And then I quickly, like two books later, I read Seven Surrenders, the second book in the Terra Ignota nota story and that had 4.5 stars now as far as i was concerned when i was reading that second book it felt like um well it didn't just feel like it It said in the first book this is the story of the seven day period in the run-up to this important event and what this important event is and halfway through book number one it's very good to like the lightning uh, we were like you know, three three or four days into it, and then I was like, okay, so in the second book, and these are kind of pretty chunky books as well, we're going to get through to that, you know, the end of that seven-day period, this very important seven-day period, lots of, you know, conspiracies come to light, lots of action happens, lots of characters are revealed, lots of, you know, all these different kind of crazy stuff that you need to happen in a big book full of, you know, world-spanning um, amazing, uh, amazingness. You know, it was it was just it was just all world building, all amazing characters, all just crazy stuff just thrown in there. Loads of great science fiction stuff, loads of great fantasy stuff, like philosophy stuff, politics stuff, all this kind of great stuff that was just thrown in there. All the kind of things that I really like, and with this this really impressive, just I don't know. I can I remember someone's review just said it takes balls to write a book like that, where just everything that you think of just go yeah, let's put it in there. We can make this work. Yeah, let's put this in there. We can make that work. Work as well we can make this work we can make that way there's just everything just goes in and uh, yeah it takes a lot of balls to do a book like that, and it hit hit my spot completely uh, perfectly so when i actually got to the end of that book i don't remember exactly what i said at the end of the review of that second book of seven surrenders which is uh, book two of four it turns out in total this is this review is for book three but uh, I kind of felt like, oh, hopefully in this next book we're going to get like a different point of view, a different narrator, because the story of our main uh, narrator, our main guy here, Mycroft Kanner, is kind of played out. We've discovered everything that we need to know. All of his mysterious backstory has been unveiled, and all of the different characters that were relying on him has been unveiled, and all of the different conspiracies have all been revealed and all of the action that takes place with this character and his main you know the the people who are he was fighting against or the people fighting for him and all these different factions it all felt like it, it all paid off so i was like okay in this next book hopefully we'll get a new narrator from a different point of view and i was say and i kind of was hoping for a different narrator from like one that's more reliable because the the unreliable narrator kind of thing in those first two books was played for as much as possible. He's always saying, hey, dear reader, you're thinking this, and this happened. Actually, no, it didn't happen that way. This happened this way. And there was these fantasy elements with these, you know, these god-type beings and people doing miracles, and it was always like, oh, is it really a miracle? Are we really looking at miracles here? Or is this just the fantastic writing of uh, Mycroft Kenner, who is our main, uh, you know, our guide through this, uh, this future history of the world? Unfortunately, what we have in this book, it just stays with the same character and all of the events that had been paid off, you know, in that first in those first two books. It's something like they go, ah, well, what's this book going to be about? Well, I guess it's going to be about the fallout from all of the stuff that happens in those previous books. And there's this kind of main conflict that's set up and it's called the will to battle. It's all these different political factions, all these different hives and these different, you know, the heads of these hives and this kind of thing. And the all of the hives, these big, you know, there's just seven different factions that the world is kind of split off into. And some countries are in hives, but some, you know, there's a European hive and the Olympian hive. I think it's a huge humanist hive and the Mitsubishi hive and all these different kind of hives that are all um, competing against each other um, and uh, yeah humans can join up with the hives or change hives and things and it's sort of like okay this is about a battle on what's going to start is this war going to begin 
And then the whole story just screeches to a halt in this one, where we just have, like, my only note that I made on Goodreads, my only Goodreads um, review update was, like, 25%, mostly a transcript of a congressional session so far. And that's what it was. It was just sort of like, okay, this politician's going to speak now, this politician's going to speak now. And I was like, they're a quarter of the way into this book, and the action hasn't started yet. And then I got this sinking feeling, understanding, oh, this book isn't just a very tight narrative, or, like, this is all the stuff that happened over the next three days days it's like this is an open-ended narrative now and things are just going to happen whenever they happen and we're going to skip forward in time oh and then two weeks later this happened and oh i let me skip forward in my story dear reader and this happened and so there isn't like the conciseness of that tight narrative saying like all of these important ha- th- ha- important things happen in seven days, and it's the most important seven days ever in the history of the last 300 years of Earth history, and I'm going to get that across to you. And it's like, great, that's, that's the seven days that I want to read a story about. And it turns out the next seven days, uh, kind of important, maybe not that important. And the next seven days, well, one important thing happened, we might as well talk about that. So the... The conciseness, well, not even, that's even a weird thing, because it's not like that the storytelling was concise. It isn't at all. If you've got, like, an audiobook which takes 15, 20 hours to get through, and you only get through three days of story, but just the drilling down into events, it's like, yeah, maybe it's the opposite of concise. I don't want something concise, but I want a lot of, um, you know, to drill down into these things. I want a lot of, like, focus on important events. And here it's sort of like, well, stuff's just happening in this book, and there isn't really a driving narrative force i guess there's going to be a war at some point and this book is sort of like the will to battle so all these people going oh we're gonna have a war oh no we're not gonna have a war we're gonna have peace no we're, we probably won't have peace but we're gonna have a war okay let's let's not have a war yet let's wait until we're ready okay let's have a war well let's make sure that these people over here don't have weapons before the war and these people oh actually let's all not have weapons okay let's, and then make sure you know all these different kind of things going on and i just i just don't just there was nothing compelling there at all. It was really difficult to keep engaged in a story where I didn't... Like, there was only one thing that I knew was going to happen in the months-long span of this story. Now, it did happen at the very end. We did get another viewpoint, but that was way too late. Like, the last hour of a 17-hour audiobook where suddenly it picks up, and I was like, oh, right, now is the time. Like, this thing that's happening in this last... Well, it may be a bit longer. Maybe the last two or three hours of a 17-hour audiobook, the, sudden, the story suddenly starts picking up again, and it did feel feel very much like, ah, oh, again, like some other series that I've read, which are probably should have been trilogies, but suddenly have been spread out into four books. That third book, it's just sort of like, guys, just pick it up a bit. You've just got to, I say guys, this is out of palm, it's a woman writer, but just, I'm just saying like uh, non-gender specific guys, you just pick it up. You've just got to push through, just understand that maybe there's only three books worth of stories instead of four books. Maybe the last book is going to pick up in the story wise. Another thing that I didn't like about this book is that the first book was just full of crazy world building and all the time there was even like all the way through the first book they were talking about the um, the OS OS this, OS this and I was like what's OS and maybe it had been mentioned early on but I didn't quite pick up on it. And it was like a quarter of the way through the second book where that next bit of world building was revealed. And all the time, all this world building which is built into the first book was still being revealed throughout the second book. Crazy political stuff, crazy conspiracy stuff, crazy um, science fictional ideas, crazy fantasy ideas and miracles and, um, and gods and all that kind of stuff going on there as well. Again, never quite sure how much of it's real or how much of it's just, you know, unreliable narrator style um, uh, ramblings, whatever it is going on. But loads of crazy stuff like that. And in this book, in uh, in the World of ba- Battle book three, there's nothing. There's no world building to go anymore. Like uh, like I said at the end of book two, I thought everything had been paid off, and everything had been paid off. There has been. There's no more building to do. There's no more world building to do. Like I say, near the end of the book, there's a little bit more about the Utopians and what they get up to. And near the end of the book, there's a little bit more. You know, like the the Olympic Games, and that's fun and things like that. But just generally, just there's n- nothing. No, I didn't learn anything new about the world. And in a book where, or in a series where the first two books, the world building was my favourite thing, or one of my favourite things about it, for that all to just finish, and it just to be like, oh, well, let's have these two politicians talking to each other. And now let's have these two politicians. And now let's have these group of politicians talking to each other. Again, didn't feel that satisfying. Another thing which I didn't like was that there was very little action that took place outside of literally the seven most important and influential and powerful people in the world talking to each other about stuff. 
That was it. It was just lots of, like, the king of this and the emperor of this and the headmaster of this and the, you know, the, the main people on this. And they were all talking and having conversations. And it was good to hear those conversations. But what I loved about the uh, the first book especially was, like, there's this family um, or this barsh as, barsh, as they call it, and it's this very little unit, and they're very powerful, but we're not quite sure why they're powerful, and they seem to just be having family squabbles, and there's other, you know, intrigue going on within the family, and these other smaller characters came in, and a lot of the characters were really small, and a lot of the, like, the the dramas were very, like, small scale, like, oh, there's there's this person having an affair there, or this person's going over here, is this an illegitimate child there? You know, it turns out a lot of those things were very important, but they felt like small scale reflecting larger scale issues. And in this book, it's just like, oh no, what we're doing is just having literally kings talking to emperors. Um, and again, it didn't really reflect like the smaller stories. Another thing, like I said before, that because... Um, Mycroft Canner, who is like the main, our main guy, our main protagonist and, uh, and narrator, because his story was kind of completed, all he was doing in this story was like, they just said, hey, just keep a record, just keep a history of what happens next. And he's like, okay. And so all he does is just keep a history and just keep a record of what comes next. Everything is happening outside of him and all of the action and all of the interesting characters are doing things, not him. Also, because his main story has been, you know, paid off, um, like Saladin, who was a massive character, especially in the second book, is just, he gets like two mentions, and I think, well, is he still around? What's going on with him? He just gets dropped completely, and lots of other characters who were so important to Mycroft Canna just get dropped and never turn up again, which is super disappointing. And also, one of the main things that I liked about the first two books was Jehovah and Bridger, who are these more fantastical characters, but especially Bridger doesn't turn up in this book again, and we do get a little bit with Achilles, but again, not very much there at all. So all the questions of, there's these fantasy elements of bringing toys to life, and all of those kind of things, are they going to pay off? Like, there's this whole thing about this other, you know, this this um, whole hall full of dolls, this whole church full of dolls, and these are being saved for what? Is it because someone is going to bring these dolls to life, and is going to do all that kind of stuff? And this whole interplay with the miracles and gods is pretty much dropped and it's sort of like oh this person's kind of like an alien here and i know but then is he is he is it really alien techno and it, all of that just seemed to just fall away from by the wayside so what we're left with is just meetings between high level politicians trying not to have a war but all agreeing that a war is going to happen and then i guess the last book is going to be what the war is maybe hope again maybe this whole series is going to stick the landing and the fourth book is going to be amazing again but this book was kind of a bit of a slog to get through because all of the things that i loved about the first book and all of the things that paid off in the second book all of those were dropped and then the, this third book is just political meetings and the language is fun and the characters are interesting and the politics is still interesting but the politics isn't new all of the pieces have been set up and we're just playing out the game of what happens once you set all this up and there are a few surprises along the way but like compared to the previous two books where like every chapter something new and interesting was in uh, introduced or resolved or a character t went off in a different direction or Mycroft revealed something else or some you know all this different interesting stuff that was happening chapter by chapter there was like three of those in the whole book and you know, two of them were in the last two chapters, in the last, like, two hours of audiobook. So, overall, very disappointing book. From the highs of the first book and the kind of, like, that I thought was sticking the landing of that first story. And it does. Like, you can just read the first book and then read the second book and you have a complete story. I would even suggest, if you've just read up to the second book and finished it, do not read this book because it isn't satisfying on any level and doesn't have a satisfying conclusion. Wait until the fourth book comes out and then people like me will read the fourth book and will say, is it worth reading past book number one or should you just stop there? And I've, this has happened to me so many times before. I was just like, oh, yeah, I'm really enjoying this series. Let me just read the next one before, like, as soon as it comes out. And I shouldn't do that. I, I was bitten by that with the um, the Prince of Nothing series as well. No, not the Prince of... What is it? The, uh, the um, Aspect Emperor or whatever it was. Book one, yay. Book two, yay. Book four. And I'm like, oh, well, I could slog. I even didn't read parts of it. And then book four, I was just like, well... Maybe I shouldn't have started the whole series. So I, I'm getting more and more into a believer of not starting into 
book two and three and four of a series until it's complete, and then you know if it's worth pushing through to the end after some really high points, like high, like high points of reading, of, of a whole year of reading in books number one and two. And then three, like one of the biggest disappointments. I'd say it's not quite a biggest disappointment as Fall of Hyperion was after Hyperion, which is still one of my, on this podcast, one of my, uh, my great um, sequel fatigue kind of things where everything that I loved about the first book was just removed and they're like, all right, let's just uh, continue on with the story. And I'm like, but wait, did you not understand what I liked about Hyperion? period like all the great stuff that was in hyperion you can't just go well well we're just gonna finish off the story by doing something like just bad storytelling and all of anyway it's a difficult one i don't want this to become a fall of hyperion rant but at least i finished this book um and i'll probably try out the fourth book but when this was recommended to me people were just saying hey it's a no-brainer of course you're gonna of course you're gonna read this next book in the series but i'm just like in a way I should have waited and I should have uh, got feedback from other people that I trust just to say, actually, you know what? It doesn't finish. It doesn't even continue the story very much, um, let alone finish off the story. And I don't even know why, because I after I read that second book in the uh, books one and two, I just presumed that that was the end of the story because all of the story ends had been tied up. And this takes 17 hours worth of audiobook to um to set some set some things in motion for me to be curious about what happens next and it's called the will to battle and it's about this war happening for the first war in 300 years in this future world and i'm like mm, i'm did I ever enjoy these characters because I thought there was going to be a battle? Did I ever enjoy this world because it was leading to a war? Not really. I really enjoyed these because there was this intense period of seven days where lots of interesting stuff happened and lots of conspiracies were revealed and lots of things were found out. And yeah, and things happened. And that I think things have to happen. Um, of course, things just, just things happening isn't a plot, isn't story. And unfortunately, this book didn't really have a story and it didn't have that many things that were happening either, which is a big disappointment. So I'm going to rate this book um, two stars. And after 4.5 from the first two books, uh, that's a real drop off. But uh, that's all I've got to go on with this one. So uh, that's it for me. I would go over and uh, read some other people's reviews of my um, uh, re- uh, like listeners and friends on, uh, on Goodreads.com. Odo rated it four stars, four and a half out of five stars he puts there. Uh, Soren rated it five stars. Veer rated it three stars. This book was so frustrating. All the weaknesses of the first two books are dialed up to 11 in this one. Rambling sentence and overlong descriptions and unreliable narrator becoming almost incomprehensible. Yeah, that is a pity. Um, the lack of clarity on the history and of Mycroft makes it even more irritating. And key characters are sidelines. Saladin, question mark? Yeah. Um... So let's get this over with so it can be evaluated as a whole because this one seems to be sending the series on a downward spiral. I don't think it's a downward spiral. I just think it's a massive step down. Like I say, all the weaknesses of the first two books are dialed up. And there were a few weaknesses in the first book, but they were kind of, for me, they were drowned out by the amazingness of the world building and characters and all the great stuff. And this didn't have any more world building. It was just like more world, those same characters, not even any new interesting characters revealed. And that was about it. So uh, I agree. I agree with Veer on this one and don't agree with Odo or Soren. Um, and then lots of other people marked it as to read. Um, someone's even marked it on shelves 2019. Joshua, that's funny. So that's it. Uh, yeah, become my friend on Goodreads. And I can see what you think about books. You can also re- uh, recommend books to me if you go over to the uh, um, books I would like to see reviewed uh, thread on the um, on the uh, SFBRP listener group on Goodreads. That's a good way of uh, getting me to read books. This one was uh, recommended there as well. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Luke Burridge there. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Luke Burridge there. You can follow me on uh, YouTube. I'm at Luke Burridge there too, or Luke forward slash Luke. But you find me in different places. Um, you can actually check out all of these episodes of the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast. Uh, also uploaded to YouTube at the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast YouTube channel. So uh, if you want to, you can check that out. If you don't want to listen on your podcast player, you can also just check it out on YouTube. It's just the audio. It's not You don't get to see a video of me doing this. Our next episode, or I say mine, the, the next episode of this podcast is going to be um, a review of Altered Carbon, uh, both the book and the TV show, uh, the Netflix show, which uh, I very much enjoyed and Juliana's uh, watched it too and we both read the book and uh, I did an episode I joined in the um, SFF audio podcast book about um, Altered Carbon I think that's coming out in a few weeks time as well Uh, but this will be covering both the book 
and the uh, and the TV show and discussing what we liked about both of them and and the best parts of both of them and what we didn't like about either of them and the changes between the two. We'll try and keep it as spoiler free as possible, but you know what happens when you when we're talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, I do though. If you want some homework before uh, listening to the next episode. Uh, watch the full Netflix show of Altered Carbon. It's really good and probably better than the book in many ways. Not as good in other ways, but better than the book in many ways. So uh, if you ever think, oh, sometimes I'd like Richard K. Morgan's Altered Carbon. I wonder what it's like. Just watch the TV show. It's all there. Or most of it's there. Right, that's it from me. Thanks a lot for listening and I'll catch you next time.